Today's case of the week is actually a request. A doctor wrote in and said, hey, can you go over the steps for placing a removable lower denture uh, attached to implants with zest attachment? So zest or locator attachments as are more commonly known. So yeah, we'd be happy to do that. So first of all, if you haven't seen a denture like that before, this happens to be a full lower denture. And as I take this off of here, you can see uh, the four locator abutments that are in place. And uh, even though this ridge this fictitious ridge, you know, has a fair amount of height, then maybe a lower denture here would work. Uh, one of my lower dentures certainly would not work there. And so um, as a result, being able to place for these uh, locator abutments on, on top of implants is an excellent way to be able to um, get some additional retention and really retention period, you know, so that the patient can have a lower denture that feels somewhat like the upper. You can see uh, the locator rings that are on the uh, inside of these, the locator caps, these are the black processing caps um, that aren't going to actually be used once uh, everything's done. There's a couple different uh, retention strengths that you can choose from. Um, three of them actually ship uh, with the case. There's a clear one that has five pounds of retention, I, a pink one that's about three pounds, and a blue one that's 1.5, and that's pretty much where I start most of my patients is with the blue one. And actually, most of them are pretty happy with the blue one, which is what Zest calls extra light uh, retention. But some people, you know, we will move up if they don't like that and go to the pink, which is twice as much. Uh, but people don't like to break nails, you know, trying to take this out or trying to, you know, strain too much as they're doing this. So how do we get to this point, I think is what the doctor uh, was asking. And so let's, let's take a look at uh, a case here and see how we get to this point. So uh, we've got a patient with their four implants placed, for example, in the maxilla and we've got our healing caps in place. And the first thing we're gonna do is just take a, an impression of this, uh, really just to make a custom tray. So just take uh, any type of uh, preliminary impression here and uh, polyvinyl uh, is typically the best way to do this. Uh, with a plastic tray is fine, doesn't need to be a metal tray. And um, you can just take uh, something like this and we just, we just need to know uh, the contours for the custom tray. And so on the second appointment, uh, we're gonna send a custom tray back to you and um, we have a preference, or I have a preference, I should say, for an open tray technique like this. So these are open tray impression copings that have now been seated down uh, onto the implants. And we'll take a quick uh, digital x-ray to make sure those are seated all the way. Uh, my preference for these just kind of stems from the fact that uh, when we look at double arch impression trays and we pour up those models, it's really difficult to get the model to go back into the polyvinyl. Um, sometimes you can get it to seat all the way, sometimes you can't. And I kind of feel that same way about closed tray impression copings, trying to get them to seat back in there. You think they're all the way in, they look like they are, but this seems like a much safer way for me, you know, to be able to do it and know that I've picked up those impression copings. So we've got the impression coping and then we have a guide pin that screws it down into the implant. And so we're going to try in our custom tray and make sure that it doesn't interfere with any of those impression copings and then just take our custom tray impression and smear off with our finger the impression material on top of those so we can see the guide pins. Let the impression material uh, cure completely and then loosen the guide pins and lift the impression copings out inside uh, of that final impression. And again, since there's no reseating uh, of the impression copings back into the impression material, you're pretty much guaranteed that you're going to get a nice accurate result. And I get a little bit nervous sometimes with uh, the clothes tray, which is why I prefer um, doing it this way. And then you'll place the uh, healing caps or healing abutments back onto the implant. Then at the next appointment, once we've had the opportunity to pour up the master impression, uh, place the analogs and get the uh, the locators in place, we will send you a bite block. And again, this will have the uh, black processing non-retentive caps on the inside. You can see those caps are hollow. Uh, when you see one of the regular uh, retention caps, they have an island in the middle because they have retention on the middle and around the outside as well. But this is the bite block. And so you are going to remove the healing abutments uh, from the patient's mouth. And on this master model, um, you're going to see the, the locator uh, abutments that'll be screwed onto the implant and place them on the same implant as they are on the master model. There's differing heights to these locator abutments, so depending on how deep 
uh, the implant was placed. Um, there's going to be different heights on these to try to get them as level as possible. So we'd like to have all four of these as parallel as possible, and we'd also like to have them as level as possible. And so make sure you use the right one uh, for the right implant. And this is what that bite block looks like uh, from the outside. So uh, you can go ahead and take the core tool and put the locator abutments into the implants. You don't need the torque wrench for this. You can just kind of hand tighten it down. And then you're going to make sure that the bite block seats uh, onto those locator abutments. And uh, once it does, this is your opportunity to move the two centrals around and if you want to change the lip support or lengthen the teeth. You can see we have some notches that are cut into the bite block for when we're ready to take um, the bite registration. So basically you're just going to go through all the regular steps that you would for a denture setup, you know, checking the S sounds, checking the F sounds, and getting your vertical and all that good stuff like you normally would. Uh, and then do your bite registration with the opposing. And uh, if you want to, you can also do, you know, something that we used to do uh, or still do with veneers, which is showing uh, the bite plane uh, to the technician by paralleling this with that interpupillary line. So you can add a little more bite registration if you want and put a stick on there. And then you're going to send this back to the laboratory with whatever shade and whatever mold you want to work with. If we're going to duplicate the patient's existing denture because they like how that looks, you send a study model of that so we're able to do that. And send that all back with uh, the locator abutments uh, unscrewed back on the model again. Put your healing abutments or caps uh, back on again and send it back. And then you can see we've actually fabricated uh, this denture and it's now ready to be tried into the patient's mouth. So on that next appointment, you're going to remove those uh, healing abutments and, and now you're going to put the locator abutments into place in the patient's mouth. And, and this time, because uh, this is for permanent, we're going to use that same uh, core tool from Zest Anchors. And by the way, if you go to ZestAnchors.com, you'll notice that they have a lot of good articles and they've got a lot of good videos uh, outlining this whole procedure as well if you want to see it more. And they're the ones who manufacture this. And they have a torque wrench that you're going to use to place these for the final time um, at uh, 30 newton centimeters uh, to place these down into the implants and make sure uh, that they're good and tight. And then we're going to take um, the denture itself and try it back into the mouth now that it's been processed and, um, and snap that into place. And uh, again, it depends which, which uh, uh, cap you want to start with, how much retention you want. I recommend the blue uh, with the extra light retention, the 1.5 pounds of retention, because that seems uh, like a good place to start because it's a nice light, but it still has enough grip where uh, they're going to notice the difference, uh, but it's not going to bend or break fingernails as they go to take it out and you can always go up if they need more and we can see here's the patient now with the denture in place smiling and happy because it's locked in and you can actually hear the snap as it goes into place much more so with the blue uh, retentive caps than with the black uh, processing caps one other thing to keep in mind while using this locator system is that it can also be done with a bar with a milled bar and so you'll notice we've got you know four implants here and four locator abutments as well, but we've also got this bar. And the milled bar really does, it's not that it does uh, much for the retention of the denture, it's still the same type of four locator attachments as we have here, but really it's the stabilization of those four implants. And uh, it really bodes well for the long-term prognosis for these implants when they're hooked together with this bar. So if I had my druthers, I would do this on every case uh, that I could, but it ends up costing the patient more, as you might imagine. You know, this is probably a couple thousand dollar lab bill more because of that milled titanium bar. So the price to the patient goes up. But this, in my mind, would be the Cadillac treatment. And this would be, uh, well, I shouldn't say Cadillac. Let's call this the Mercedes Benz treatment. Let's call this the uh, Chrysler 300 treatment, just because I had one of those. And then let's call a lower denture with nothing in it. Um, the VW uh, uh, treatment and because that would be kind of our, our one position we didn't want to take. The cheapest way would be to have no attachments and then four locators by itself would be the next and then the best uh, would be the four locators with the bar connecting the implants for the uh, overall longevity of those implants. But of course it also increases the vertical hair too so we may not necessarily have room for this as well. It adds about another two and a half millimeters to the height of that bar and we need a couple millimeters for that bar whereas just the four locators by themselves 
you can see how nice and low profile those are. When those retentive caps snap onto there, we'd like to have about a millimeter of space between the cap uh, and the gingiva. So I've had cases where I've removed like old uh, ball attachments that have been on the implants and they were much taller. And by the time we put the locator abutments on, we gained a, a millimeter and a half, sometimes two millimeters of space, which can mean the difference between a broken overdenture and a not broken uh, overdenture for one thing. And so you can see nice low profile um, along here uh, as we look at, at the locator attachments. And that's why, because we need the differing heights and therefore different implant systems. So obviously you need to let us use, let us know what implant system you used and what diameter it was. And then we'll go ahead and we'll pick the locator attachments uh, and their different heights. They come in six different heights so that we can get these as level as possible uh, going across this way. We want that to be a nice level plane uh, as you go across. So when you do take out old attachments, for example, I can think of a couple patients who had some ball attachments for a lower denture. We unscrewed those ball attachments and then we screwed in some of that. Well, let's say we're gonna retrofit a, a denture and uh, take out the ball attachments and switch over to something like we have here with the locators. The first thing we're gonna do is create some space in the denture. So we'll prep around um, the old housing that's in there for the ball abutment and then pop that out and then just route it out a little bit more around that. If anything, we want to create almost you know, too much space here because our locator housing that's going to sit on here needs to go inside of here and we need to leave some room for the resin that we're going to cure it in with. So we're going to just hog it out a little bit uh, with a burr around that and take the old housing out of there. The other thing we're going to want to do to make sure that we don't um, force this resin where we don't want it to go is we're going to place a lingual channel. So once you've, let's say we're just doing these two right here, pretend these two don't exist, we route this out and hollow it out to make room for the new locator housing. And then we're gonna turn the denture and seeing where that hole is, we're gonna drill a channel here through the denture and one here. We want a relief or escape channel for the resin that we put in somewhere to go besides being pushed down around the implant itself. So once we've done that and kind of hollowed it out, we'll try it back into the patient's mouth and we want to make sure it's a passive fit. We want to make sure we've re removed enough acrylic so we're not bumping into our locators. Once we know that we've done that, then we're going to place a white blockout ring. It's a little ring, looks like a little O-ring that's going to sit right around uh, the locator. And what it's going to do is make sure we don't get resin down around the implant as we reline this. So we put the little white blockout ring uh, on these two and put it down into place. And then we'll take that black cap the one that you see right here, it wouldn't be in here at this point. We would have taken out the old uh, housing that was in there. And we'd take each of these two black caps and pop it down onto these two right here. And it would be sitting down on top of that ring. So we'd have our black cap here and then we'd have the white O-ring right around at the gingival level. And now that the housings, those black ones are in there, we would try in the denture one more time just to make sure it still passively fits because we've added a little vertical height here. Uh, by putting the black cap on. And as long as it uh, seats uh, passively and goes over well, then we're ready to get started. So we'll, we'll sandblast the inside of the denture in those two areas. We'll place a, um, and I just use like a little micro etcher. We'll place some bonding agent here, the Triad VLC Visible Light Cure Bonding Agent into these two holes, air thin it, then we'll cure it. And then we'll come back over here to the, to the little housings, the black housings we're gonna pick up and we will place a little light cure over on both of these as well, air thin it, and then cure that. And so now we have bonding agent here, bonding agent here on the inside of the denture. And then we'll use that triad, a dual line, a dual cure denture resin. Looks just like an impression gun. And we're just gonna squirt it through the tip. It's an intra, looks like an intraoral tip, just like we would use for a polyvinyl siloxane impression. And we're gonna squirt our resin into each of these um, into each of the, obviously without the black cap there, and then seat it down into the patient's mouth. And as we push it down into place, um, we're gonna have the patient bite together lightly. We do not want the patient to squeeze really hard. If they squeeze really hard, it's gonna, it's gonna bottom out the denture on the top of that. And we'd like some resin on top. So we just tell them to bite lightly uh, down onto that. Not, this is not a squeeze as hard as they can. And uh, obviously we won't be able to see it, but some of the excess resin will come out of these lingual channels as they close down. And we can take our light curing unit and start to cure it from the facial. You can cure 
uh, through the acrylic, but we'll still wait the five minutes for that triad uh, dual cure to go through its complete uh, chemical setting reaction. So once it does, then we'll take out uh, the denture after it's been five minutes and uh, we'll notice um, that the block out rings, those little white O-rings that we had here are now gonna be stuck to the inside of the denture. So we can pull out those, um, pull out those two little uh, caps there and see if we have any voids. We might have a little void. Um, we might have a little rough area there where we can go with a burr and smooth it off. And if we have a void, we can just squirt a little more of that triad dual cure in and then use a micro brush uh, to kind of shape it uh, into place and, uh, and then cure that again and make sure that's nice and smooth. And once we've done that, we use that core tool uh, from Zest Anchors to take out the two black non-retentive ones, uh, unscrew the attachment, and then you'll take those blue caps and snap those back into place. Um, and then at that point, we're ready to have the patient uh, try it back in. We just need to flip it over and polish the lingual, the channels uh, where we had the excess resin coming out, pop it back in and see how the patient feels with those blue caps. Most of the time, uh, it'll feel fantastic and they'll be ready to take it home and wear it for a week before they come back for their first uh, post-op appointment. So uh, that's a very uh, quick overlook at uh, how we're gonna do an implant uh, overdenture utilizing a locator uh, attachment from uh, Zest Anchors. And again, at zestanchors.com, this company does a great job of education if you wanna see some more detail on the clinical procedures for both of these techniques.